the changes of the landscape down there have been incredible. Transformation is just unbelievable. To see trees that I'm standing against now this high and have this shelter is just phenomenal. It's exciting. 35 kilometres north of Bendigo in central Victoria is the agricultural community of Kamaruka. Here, a small number of families run large cropping and sheep farms. The area has historically been reliable for agriculture, but one of the significant threats to farming in the area comes from salinity. The Kamaruka catchment covers 2,500 hectares and stores large quantities of salt. Salinity first appeared on Kamaruka's agricultural land in the mid-1950s, but 20 years later more than 1,000 hectares were salt affected. This land lay bare for 50 years until 2004 when a local community group worked together to demonstrate how this land could be returned to productive use. In just over two years a salt wasteland has been remarkably transformed. This is the story of Northern United Forestry Group's Kamaruka project. The group was formed in 1998 with eight foundation members. Um, Ten years on now we've got uh, 45 family members. The Northern United Forestry Group, NUFG, is a group of people who share an interest in growing native trees primarily for saw logs and firewood. The aim of the group is to develop farm forestry in a region where the annual rainfall is less than 450 millimetres and provide forest products, environmental services and community benefits. In 2004 the group won the National Landcare Research Award for its contribution to low rainfall farm forestry. NUFG is a diverse group that includes a couple who run a nursery, a cropping and sheep farmer, an export hay producer, a chicken farmer, a sawmiller and even a hydrogeologist. The group also fulfills an important social role in the community and takes its name from the local football team that folded in the mid-1990s. In 2004, the National Landcare Program funded the group to set up a demonstration project to reclaim 40 hectares of salt-affected land on the Hay family farm at Kamaruka. Well, we got involved when Northern United Forestry Group was looking for land to run this project on and um, the boys, three sons, own this part of the land and they agreed to let Northern United Forestry start this project up. Over the entire area of, uh, of the area that we've treated, I suppose, uh, there wasn't much of it that wasn't affected by salt and severely affected by salt. And look, we're, t we're dealing with a, with a groundwater system here that is three quarters of the salinity of seawater and it sits within a metre of the surface normally. The paddock we're standing in now, where the salt push is, uh, was very prone to salt starting back in 19, around about mid-1950s when this was cropped and uh, it was a very wet winter and parts of it just didn't come up and later on it was found out it was uh, because of the salinity and from then on this land wasn't able to be cropped because it just became progressively worse and worse. In wet winters um, this would be just all water because water table would be so high and you wouldn't be able to walk or drive on this part of the land. The first step was to complete a geophysical survey and produce a map of the degree of salting across the project site. The plan was to match the salt tolerance of the plantings to the salinity of the soil. Next came soil preparation, where the experience of NUFG members proved invaluable. The main establishment techniques is to do soil preparation in the autumn, and that means that we use three tine rippers because you get a multiple uh, shattering effect on some of this ground. Um, after you use a multiple ripper, you can then add, we'd like to add gypsum um, at, at a reasonable rate, um, something like a cubic metre per every 200 metres. Uh, you can add organic matter 
And I'm talking in, in soils too that are a little bit degraded like that is because the more preparation we do, the better the result of the establishment. So after we uh, leave it through the winter and you generally get rainfall which softens and mixes that soil and makes weeds grow in the spring, then we will uh, start, do some uh, roach hoeing. Even through the winter you can, depending on the conditions. If you've had rain and the conditions are right, you can roach you hoe it up. Uh, at least once, you might have to do it again uh, a couple of times. But come late September, you, you sum up the situation, you get into October and it's the time for planting then. And so the roach hoeing, the final roach hoeing should leave the soil bed in a condition as good as if you were growing tomatoes in, in your garden. In the first year, the group planted 11,000 trees, 10,000 saltbush plugs, six hectares of direct seeded saltbush and native grasses, and five kilometres of direct seeded trees across 32 hectares. Species we've worked with have been sugar gum, swamp yate, uh, and several different sorts of acacia. The growth rates have been very, very good. We've been very pleased with the outcome, particularly the swamp yate and the sugar gum. So the, the, the species selected have been very well chosen by the people who did it and have performed remarkably well. We're very fortunate when we planted this saltbush and the trees that just 10 days or eight days after it was sown, we had 40 mils of rain and I think we had approximately 90% um, establishment on the salt bush. Uh, had it happened this year with no rain, we probably would have been a fail, but the gods must have looked down on us the day we were planting and the, nearly every tree we planted grew on every salt bush, so we're very fortunate that, that way. Monitoring is a very important part of the Kamaruka project. This includes measuring changes in groundwater, learning about the impacts of grazing, and documenting changes in the vegetation. It's revealed some important findings. It's a fairly intense project given the size of the, the area we're dealing with. So in a 40 hectare site, we have uh, 13 monitoring bores, and uh, 10 of those bores are actually set up with electronic data loggers. And the monitoring has been set up so that it not only tells us what's happening across the, the whole of the areas, but uh, it also is telling us what's happening under each of the treatments. That is, what's happening under the trees, what's happening under the salt bush, what's happening under the native vegetation. And uh, really, that level of intensity of monitoring, uh, together with electronic monitoring, is something that's pretty special. I don't know of any other areas that are as well monitored in, uh, in Australia as what we have here. One of the challenges that we've had is the water tables have been falling away um, over the last two or three years. The challenge for us though is that the water tables are actually falling away um, in part due to the dry conditions established by the 10 year drought that we find ourselves within and in part we believe because of the treatments that we've actually put in place. So one of the challenges for us is to try and sort out what we can attribute to the trees, what we can attribute to the salt bush and what we attribute to the drought. We, we decided to extend our monitoring into the native vegetation, the remnant vegetation at uh, both the northern end and the southern end of the site where we have uh, two 300 year old box trees really just to see why those trees were in fact uh, surviving under very shallow water tables with very saline groundwater. And uh, what we found in the northern end in particular was remarkable. We found that the water tables there were five to six metres lower than what they were in adjacent areas that uh, had high water tables and salinity problems. And I guess that sent us down a path of trying to figure out why. And it's pretty clear to us that um, Remarkably, these trees are transpiring some of this very saline groundwater and they are maintaining water tables at reasonable depth. And, uh, and to a large extent, that right rewrites some of the science that we've done in the last 10 or 20 years. We have to look at these things again. Um, but it doesn't stop there. We've actually got uh, sugar gums and uh, uh, Occidentalis flat top yate and a range of other trees out there that are growing on a water table that's only one and a half, two metres deep. And in the middle of this uh, 
amazing drought that we're in, those trees have just never looked back. They never looked healthier. Well, you know, growing in that saline environment, uh, you would expect that they might not be doing as well as they, as they are. A grazing trial was run to determine the productivity benefits of the revegetation work at Kamaruka. The trial compared the weight changes and general health of lambs grazing the project site with lambs grazing on lucerne. The weight gains were significant on both the lucerne and the revegetated saline land, with the lambs on the lucerne putting on more weight as expected. None of the lambs suffered any ill health during the trial. Well this area here, it wouldn't even run, well, wouldn't even run 10 sheep to, to uh, 70 acres, but now we've got 100 lambs in here grazing on salt push. They've been in here for probably a month now. They'll stop in here hopefully till end of January, early February. It, uh, it helps to be able to put, keep them in here so they can get on a normal year, this being a drought, it's not normal, but it will help the loosens get away for two or three weeks. Then you can rotate through the loosen and the salt push. We found out last year that sheep could stop in here for quite a considerable time without losing any of their, their condition and then finish them off on the loosen when it got more established. Sheep grazing on salt bush need constant access to fresh drinking water. If you uh, happen to taste a bit of salt bush yourself, you definitely need a drink after it. And the same with the sheep, they graze close to the, to the uh, water troughs. They'll have, have a little eat of a, a um, salt bush and then as we can see now one's come in for a, a drink and then they'll go away for a minute or so come back and have more. Monitoring changes in vegetation across the project area involves photographing and measuring selected plants every two months. By graphing the changes in plant volume over time, the impacts of grazing, along with the ability of fodder plants to recover from grazing, can be seen. It has been incredible to watch the growth rates of the particular uh, plants that we are uh, recording. Some of the other things that I've noted there was the, with the, uh, the salt bush, uh, after they had been completely stripped by the sheep in the grazing part of the project, the regeneration has been astronomical. One minute there's just sticks and next time you're down there they're just covered again. Farm forestry provides multiple benefits, one of which is habitat for wildlife. An initial bird survey detected 35 species on or near the project land. The remnant vegetation supported the greatest diversity and number of birds, followed by the new farm forestry. Few birds were observed on the grassland and adjacent farmland. Wildlife diversity is expected to increase with time as the project site develops. The Kamaruka project is a good example of how public funds can be invested confidently in a well-organised community group to produce meaningful research outcomes. Well, I think that it's, it's important to actually be able to, to get it started when you're not sure of what you're doing. We've been able to, to get all this established and do it so well. And, and, but in this case, I think it's, it's much better in, in that um, generally that's where it finishes. People plant trees for salt and walk away and, and leave it and uh, we've been able to continue to monitor it and it's just amazing to see how excited you can get a grown man like Phil to, when he comes along to the meetings with his graphs and uh, he's just making ground-breaking discoveries all the time with such a relatively small amount of the budget. NUFG members take great pride in the rapid transformation at Kamaruka. Unbelievable to think that there's a drought on and we've got this fresh growth everywhere and the stock looking well. It provides a real spiritual lift to us to see green trees growing in otherwise desolate and barren landscape. Oh, it's been an amazing transformation from what you still see next door from just a salt pan to now it's hard to, you, know, you can't see across it, it's just green. 
Australia has huge areas of salt affected land that could be returned to productive use. NUFG's Kamaruka project clearly demonstrates one successful approach founded on good science and driven by an active community group. I think don't be daunted by the prospect of uh, losing your land and if you have a look around here we've turned we've transformed this area in what was becoming a wasteland into a very valuable piece of land that um, you can protect your stock in, in bad weather and your stock are actually, there's um, statistics showing that the stock are actually putting on weight at better than a lot of other areas are in, so don't be daunted by the, by the prospect, just have a go. To see trees that I'm standing against now this high and have this shelter is just phenomenal, it's exciting and you know a lot of us are on just a huge learning curve here, it's about, I sometimes think it's about 80 degree learning curve, learning about stuff that we all grew up with to have thousands of sheep on a place and, and you get a drought like this and the dust blows and everything that, and to see something like this that sheep can run amongst and have shelter, uh, still have feed is just fantastic and uh, it's exciting for everyone, highly recommend it to everyone to have a go at it all. In a time of drought and stress just to come down here and just stand around and look around and see the amazement of what's been transformed in the last two or three years it just helps your day to day life. It's certainly part of what uh, drives me. I mean I have, I have a particular interest in this site um, because of the very detailed research that we're able to do through our monitoring program here combined with the treatments that we have. Um, but the ability to take that information back to a group and get immediate positive feedback from that group uh, once a month and to see them turn up to the field days with all of the other people that are involved here really I guess is just a way of of making you understand that all of this is in fact worthwhile, that everybody has the same interest in the area in terms of understanding the processes, understanding the relationship between the vegetation and the saline area and the water balance. And uh, I guess it's been a situation where when we've been able to communicate that well to people, um, it just seems to expand the value of the project and the knowledge and the feedback that people get out of it.